Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a mythopaic Charles Coulomb. Mythopaic? You mean a maker of myths? Yes. A, a, a man who manufactures uh, 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 weird tales and so forth. Yeah. Well... I do belong to the Mythopaic Society, which studies the work of General Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and Charles Williams, the Inklings, in other words. So in that, you could say that you could call me Mythopaic in the sense you could call anyone anything, uh, any adjective from an organization they belong to. Both of us could be called Colombian, for instance. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Okay. But you also so be... just tell tales. Tell tales? Yeah. Tall tales. Tall tales? Yeah. You mean make things up? Yeah. Out of whole cloth? Yes. Package, drivel, and dump it on the uh, unsuspecting minds of America? Uh-huh. All right. Let me explain to you why you're wrong. Why you have the whole thing totally incorrect. Firstly, you live in the greatest, freest, and best nation of the world, right? So they say. That you'll swallow anything. So it's not just me. You've already swallowed it, so it's okay. But you have a different brand. What? A, a, a different brand? What are you talking about? I mean, it's a different brand of crazy, you know? Uh, uh, oh, I like that. A different brand of crazy. Yeah. It's like layers of stupid. I like it. Yeah. The different brand of crazy. Well, but it, you see, the thing is, it's not, a, it's not a brand of crazy that I'm either A, capable of imposing on you, or B, that you will delight in accepting the way we do the kind of crazy our masters give us. See? You impose it every week, and I'm always reluctant of accepting. You know, see, here you go. Here, here's your problem right here. Firstly, we have to define crazy, don't we? Okay, sure, go ahead. What would you say crazy was? Crazy was having is having a huge disconnect from reality and creating your own reality. That's ah, not true. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Now, how do you define reality? Reality is an objective view of the senses. Sight, I, sound. I see. So would you equate reality with truth? Would I equate reality with truth yes i would would you now yeah okay very nice now were you aware that the two most wonderful people in all los angeles the sussexes were recently interviewed by oprah winfrey uh yes were you aware that oprah winfrey is universally acknowledged to be america's sob sister Her agony aunt. I feel like you're trying to play games here when you say universally acknowledged. Like, that is reality. (laughs) Well. (laughs) Now, see, you're getting suspicious. I can feel you're emanating. Your aura has turned a bright purple. Just because, see, some people have deficient senses. You see, some people are colorblind. (laughs) You see? Oh, and, and that so you bring up Oprah Winfrey. they see things that actually aren't, it's not true. You see? Well, and so I think that would be an example with what you did with Oprah of various perceptions not being true. So you don't think Oprah is universally acknowledged? Of, of what? As being America's sob sister slash agony aunt. Agony aunt? 
yeah, you know, someone you turn like Dear Abby. That's the the term of the in the trade for a, a an advice column person. So now getting out. I mean, can't anyone be a sob sister? Well, yeah, but some of us are bigger than others. I mean, Dear Abby and uh, her twin sister, actually, true story, uh, Ann Landers, they were, before Oprah, they were the two great agony odds in the United States. Everybody read their columns. So okay, she's Oprah the biggest. Took... Okay, now, she, just as I say, interviewed the Sussexes. And as she encourages everyone to do, she encouraged. <laughs> you're looking like you're about to suffer pain. Like you're just about to get spanked. That's the look on your face. Appearances can be deceptive, Charles. All right. Well, let me guarantee you to our studio audience, I am not going to hit you. I'm not going to physically harm you in any way. No, metaphorically. Well, that's another Figuratively. issue. Figuratively. That's also another issue. However, she encouraged Princess Megan to tell her truth. And Princess Megan, in turn, responded with, well, my truth is. And that's Are you a serious? Very common. Wait. I'm quite serious. Wait. Wait. They use those words exactly. Yeah. And those are very common phrases today. My truth, your truth, etc. That's actually literally how the verbiage goes when you're studying relativism proper in philosophy. Yes, of course it is. And it's, again, and in the, uh, what passes for the uh, mental uh, uh, bloodstream of our beloved country, and really throughout the West. Okay, so, so you're, I know where you're going. So, okay, if... so. Reality is relative based on a person's truth, my truth, your truth. Okay, Exactly. Great. At least that's what most of our country claim to believe. Now, that being the case, I'm actually part of the mainstream, and I'm helping you adjust. Yes, you see? Wait, how are you part of the mainstream? I'm sorry. Well, I'm creating your truth for you. Oh, so you're part of the mainstream in that you're coercive in that sense. <laughs> no, no, I'm in the sense that I'm helping. Enabling, I think, is the phrase you might say. I'm enabling you to create your own reality. With guidance, of course. I, I, I don't like thinking like this. You see, you're seeming very confused. Who wouldn't be? Well, remember, confusion is the guardian of truth. I'm trying to reconcile my reality with your reality because I don't feel like my reality is similar to your reality. My reality is a lot older. That's it's been sure. around longer. It's it's been around a lot longer. And not only that, my reality is certified by the National Administration for the uh, terminally. Uh, 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 discontinued and there's not that's not all that's not all at all i happen to know that reality as a concept is in fact a crutch for those who can't handle fantasy that's right what's the difference between fantasy and reality well the difference is that fantasy could be whatever i want it to be Reality sometimes needs to be beaten into life. But didn't you just kind of illustrate that reality can be whatever you want it to be? Well, indeed, but it resists sometimes, and it has to be held with its issues. Okay. Let me give you an example. Now, we all know that men and women are completely equal, and that uh, men are never better than women in anything. Right? Okay, yeah. Okay, sure. Now, there is a prevailing, or has been anyway, it's almost entirely gone now, a prevailing notion that uh, because of their superior physical abilities, men were better in combat arms than the armed forces than women. Yeah. Well, now we've overcome this superstition, 
and women are being fully integrated into combat arms. Yeah. So they'll be able to participate on an equal basis with men. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's wonderful. Now, a person like yourself would say, yeah, that's nice and make yourself feel good in peacetime, but you're going to get people killed, slaughtered, if you ever go to war with an army like that. Hmm. This is what I mean by reality occasionally having to be helped with its issues. Yeah. Yeah. Now There's... don't you feel better? I do feel better. The um, Did you hear about that thing? Uh, I forgot what was happening in the government. I tried to... <laughs> you tried to tune out. Me I tried too. to tune out, but I couldn't help but... there People were complaining about the transgender thing in sports because... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're trying to repeal uh, what went through. Why? That's exactly... That's exactly what I was going to say. And truthfully, I don't want them to repeal it. I want no! them to. I, I want to give them what they want, good and hard. You bet. Finita la comedia. Bring it down to its its obvious uh, reality. I, I, uh, yeah, I want yeah. women's sports. I want women's sports to. Let's see. Let's see how this goes. Let's see how this looks. Let's let's I, let, let's play I, this out. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've had, uh, I have a good friend of mine who will go nameless because he is a good friend of mine, but he's a liberal columnist in our great Southwest. And I often find myself retweeting his tweets because he's, you know, he's a, a liberal with a brain. But every time now he's, he's complaining about a lot of what's coming out of Washington. And every time he does that, I simply retweet, well, at least the orange man is gone. What? That's so sadistic. I love that. What? I, I, everything's good now. The orange man is gone. The you know, we bring the jubilee. <laughs> it must be now the, king, the kingdom coming in the year of jubilo. The orange man is gone. Everything's wonderful now. <laughs> uh. And I, I mean, one of the, uh, one of the. Uh, Terrible things for uh, decent and honest liberals. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to shock you. They keep but using these people. oxymorons. Yeah, I know. Intelligent liberal. They do exist, although they're never in charge somehow. Uh, kind of like decent priests when I was a kid. Anyway, uh, the point is that they're horrified by what's going on, but they don't really see, uh, or maybe they're beginning to, they were given a lot of Kool-Aid to swallow, and they don't like the taste. You know, it's that arsenic undertow that kind of... Aftertaste. Yeah, it's like... You know, I, I, I don't really think I don't drink it. No, I don't think you drink it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, though. It does remind me of something Mrs. Malloy used to say. Yeah. Do you see how pained you look? I'm not, I'm not pained. I'm just taking a nap while you finish up. This is a woman who came west in a covered wagon. And by west, I mean into western Canada. That's right. She, as a little girl, she helped settle the wilds of Alberta and Saskatchewan and so forth. And, uh, you know, she knew what was what. Mm -hmm. And you know what she said to me? What? She said that the most exciting thing that ever happened to her in her life was meeting Marie Dressler in downtown Hollywood in 1930. I believe it. Well, it's true. Good old Marie Dressler. You bet. One of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Uh, the best. Um, she was. I love Marie Dressler. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of, uh, what's new, Charles? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know they've had the the uh, right just here at Trubal. This is this is really bizarre. Talking about coincidence, this past week, the uh, initial formation of the uh, Marie Dressler Fan Club here in Trubal opened up. All Austrians, not a single Yank among them. Can you imagine? 
being very mythopoeic right now. <laughs> you don't believe me, in other words. That's right. You don't think Marie Dressler has fans in Trubal? I don't think she has many fans anywhere. I don't think anyone's heard of this lady. Oh, yeah? You ever hear of a movie called Dinner at Eight? Yes. You ever hear of Tech Boat Abbey? No. Oh, well. Anyway, Dinner at Eight is, was her last film, and she is brilliant in it. I recommend it highly. And you'll be able to see the lady who lit up Mrs. Malloy's life till the end of her days. Which, by the way, was also explained the name of her cat, which was Murray. Okay. Named after? W what? Who? Marie Dressler. Okay. You seem so confused today. Have you been eating your Wheaties or did you give them up for Lent? Come on. You can tell me. I I didn't give Wheaties up for Lent. I'm sorry. Oh, well. So you're just enjoying your Wheaties, kicking back every morning. All right, that's fine. What uh, As far as things that have happened, it's been a quiet uh, quiet week here in Truma, my hometown, out on the Minnesota prairie. Uh, it's, it's, you know, lockdown continues. They're uh, whispering about it opening up again after Easter. The numbers of tests and infections have gone up. Uh, but, you know, the numbers of tests have gone up, so the numbers of infections go up. The numbers of deaths, not really. The ICU, there are about 938 people in the whole country in ICU. Uh, you know, the, the problem with all this stuff is that it's kind of a moving target. You know, you don't know what's real. There, there's been a spike in cases, but that was accompanied by a huge upsurge in tests. I myself got tested for the first time this past week. I've not been tested until now. Well, they I... came out. Yeah. Sorry. No, a lady came out with a big swab. And I looked at it. I said, what are you going to stick that into? And she said, your nose. And I said, well, if it comes out gray, you went too far. Wow. <laughs> she laughed. But I was negative. You'll be happy to know. That's good. Um, okay. Is the disease making any progress in L.A.? No, it's... it's um going down to the lowest levels it's been in a while um in california at least uh it's like two thousand wow. a day now or something two two and a half thousand a day so, so governor newsom is going to commit suicide to celebrate or uh yeah i don't know i don't know but the recall is uh, gathering uh, gathering force Honestly, since the last recall, I'm not so hyped about another recall. No, I realize, but I understand we're, we're, we're hyped or not. That strength. Um, they say they have the two million signatures that they need. Yeah, we do, for sure. Well, we, we wow. I don't I don't think we needed two million. I thought we needed one and a half million. Uh, yeah, but they wanted two million for safety's sake. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, you know, uh, out of if you have two million, uh, even if they throw out five hundred thousand votes uh, or signatures, you're still you're still golden. I see. Okay. Um... So we might lose our governor. I mean. What, what, it reminds me of one of those lines in L.A. Confidential uh -huh. where I forgot, but they're shaking down the district attorney. And basically it's the implication that it doesn't matter how many how many people you get rid of, uh, like 10 more will get off the bus every day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, he was talking about the, uh, where they, they were complaining about the murdered actor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they said, ah, Tim Morgan off the bus every day. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's not the, it, it's not the person that's the problem. It's the system. 
It's, I mean, I mean, systemic basically, ra- it's systemic racism. I mean, it, it's an infestation. I mean, basically, anything short of like a a full blown exorcism, it's just not going to cut it. <laughs> so wait a minute. What are you telling me? <laughs> You're, you're telling me that the culture of evil, insanity, and stupidity that dominates our political system will not be affected by changing one man? No. Is that what you're saying? It's like stomping on one cockroach. That's a dead cockroach. Yeah, but you've got an infestation. Yeah. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like eating an elephant. You know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh... All right, let's move on. No memes of production for today. Nothing worth uh, nationalizing, unfortunately. But... See, that's what happens in a socialist economy. Yep, I know. <laughs> uh... <laughs> so... On to the questions. Questions. Oh, those. Uh, well, I don't know. It's okay. I know. Just rely oh, right. on me. That's, that's fine. Okay. I'll, I will. Good. Uh, first questions from Anthony. Did Charles see Oprah's recent interview with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle? If so, what are some of his thoughts? Well, my truth is that I didn't. Uh, I honestly, contrary to what I said earlier in the program, I really, it's difficult for me to watch Oprah under any circumstances and to watch her with two of the most ridiculous people on earth. I, I Please. I mean, Princess Megan, of course, I mean, she's my home girl. We grew up in the same place, taught by the same order of nuns. I get it. Uh, she had no more business uh, being a princess than I do. As for Prince Harry... The world's uh, most famous simp. Yeah, that's about the size of it. He was a good soldier, and like so many people who are only good soldiers and nothing else, he really should never have been allowed out in civilian life. He's not the brightest bulb on the tree. There's no doubt about that. Uh, There was several kind of lewd nicknames we had for such people when I was in school, which I'm not going to use because I'm a nice person, basically. But, uh, you know, she's much the smarter of the two of them. And uh, in terms of, I probably want, I would probably prefer talking with her and drinking with him. How do you drink with someone and not talk with them? Well, you don't have to have a conversation. You can sing, you can drink, you know, slap her on the back. It's a different kind of, of relationship. I It would be uh, having a... I, I, I really wouldn't want to have an in-depth conversation with her. But if you gave me a choice between the two of them, I'd go for her for the, ch- for the uh, jabber and him for the booze. That doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you go uh, with? Why don't you talk to him? You really would. would talk to her over him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she'd drive me crazy. But he, uh... actually, you know what? I take that back. He would have war stories to tell. I mean, there's got to be something. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, fine. He gets the conversation as well as the drink. But okay. now she's stuck with nothing. It's probably because of racism. It's definitely because of racism and oppression. Babylon B really nailed this one. Um, their headline for this is, Meghan Markle inspires millions of young girls with a message that no matter how famous, rich, and powerful they are, they will always be oppressed. That is a, 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 an important message of hope for our time. And I, I think it, it says a lot that uh, Babylon... Uh, Babylon B has become a leading news source superior to CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, uh, Reuters. You know, they actually do have a news source now. It's actually called Not the Bee. 
I like I, right before we did this show, I I looked at not the B, and they have news items that you can't tell whether they're satire, but they're actually news items, like the one where it's like um, what I just read before the show, Portland um, after defunding the police, uh, homicides increased twentyfold, literally. How could that happen? And now they're trying to fund the police again. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wow, Portland who would have thought? St- Portland needs to stick to its stupid guns. <laughs> yes. You know, these people are so idiotic. Portland needs to stand tall. You keep them cops defunded. You put your rear ends out on the line. Yeah, babe. That's what I'm talking about. You, Portland, I salute you. You you guys, you're showing us the way. You stick to your guns. <laughs> Don't change horses in midstream. Don't lose out on a winning ticket. You guys, <laughs> don't take this crap. Ooh, 20 times. So what? <laughs> they, you know what? They probably were racists who deserve to die. Yeah. Uh-huh. Great. Portland, I salute you. Stay strong. <laughs> what a bunch of stupid idiots. <laughs> God almighty. You know... You put, calm down, Charles. You put morons in charge. What did my old daddy say? When you're stupid, bad things happen. Again and again and again, ladies and gentlemen, your city elections really are important. Because if you don't care, you'll be run by morons. Well, stupid people. You know, I mean, utter jerks. Would it be nice? I know. We could defund the police and, and then plant flowers. And everything would be better. Yeah. You know, that... they Reality TV shows should emerge from that state because they also... Another thing they have going for them is that state has legalized hard drugs. Oh, very So good. it's like... Well, that's great. And that's a... See, what I would like, you know, you th- speaking of a reality show, you know what? We call it City Council, Portland City Council. And okay. you just went, hi, I'm Councilman Jerk. This is my office. And we're going to have a council meeting. I get to vote. And it's really great because, like, when I was young, everybody said I was stupid. But who's the city councilman now, huh? Yeah. I think that would be a perfect show. The layers of stupid. Just, you know, you, you stupid. It's our gross national product, ladies and gentlemen. It's who we are. Stupiditas omnia vincit. You've heard me say it before. I say it again. The marching morons. Idiocracy. Yeah. Bring it on. President Camacho. That's where we're at. Layers of stupid. I like that. I picture like a really nasty, ugly cake. (laughs) 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 And you keep hoping as you take off one layer, there's something better under it. And you're wrong. (laughs) The, um... But taking this back to Meghan Markle, um, as, as stupidity, well, as, as yeah, <laughs> um, you, you know what occurred to me with this? She's basically calling everybody racist in the royal family. Every, well, every, 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 yeah, they're, they're, they are. We we know and this. Thoughts of suicide. Blah blah blah. Um, it occurred to me that. She absolutely doesn't see the Queen Mother as any sort of role model whatsoever, and that she absolutely, absolutely has no respect for the Queen Mother or how she, the gracious way she went about her position oh. for that long, right? Because I mean, basically, Meghan Markle, uh, Meghan Markle is the antithesis of that. No, she is. I mean, well, and that, that could be exactly what Harry saw in her. You know, uh, I mean, how is she different from all his other babes? Well, she certainly was the antithesis of the queen. The queen, I mean, you know, she, she, for better or worse, she inherited a position which, due to the constraints of history, etc., etc., in a lot of ways doesn't allow her a great deal of freedom. 
to do what she wants to do. And that's true. That's true of any uh, any position of authority, of course, but it's particularly galling in a sense in Britain and the Commonwealth because the difference between the reality and the appearance is so tremendous. I mean, on paper, she's supreme, subject only to an act of parliament. But that's not how it is in reality. I mean, if it were in reality, Edward VIII could have done what Henry VIII did and said, oh, you don't like my marital choices, Mr. Baldwin? Good. Your head will be delivered tomorrow. Bye-bye. So on paper, Edward VIII has many of, had many of the same rights that Henry VIII did. But of course, by his time, for all sorts of reasons, that wasn't how the monarchy worked. And it's certainly not how it works now. So the queen has had to spend her, gosh, how long has she been? 70 years in office. Uh, she's had to spend them, uh, almost 70, uh, just very often cowing, kowtowing to uh, politicians who were utter garbage. And from time to time, you can, you've been able to see a little bit of the strain, but she managed. And she managed to do what a quote-unquote modern monarch has done, which is to be a sort of living flag, a center of unity for her peoples. Uh, mind you, I, I kind of prefer Franz Josef's vision of what a modern monarch should do, but Austria-Hungary was not Britain. And that's just not the way it's evolved. As I say, I wish it were different. I wish the sovereign in a lot of, uh, a lot of circumstances could just say, no, we're not going to do that. And if you don't like it, Mr. Prime Minister, you're out of a job. Savvy? But that's not how it works. Now, Megan, on the other hand, I mean, with, with that overarching thing, the Queen basically learned to subdue her personality for the sake of the of the uh, the office. But that is the proper deal that every office holder should do. You submit your will and your right and your your freedom to the greater good that's the price you pay or should pay for having a position but with all sorts of people across the globe in various high offices the modern way is to well i'm going to put my mark on the office okay uh i just thought of a really fun question so in the pre-show we are talking uh we took a question uh on uh, can the Pope uh, depose a secular ruler, yeah. uh, right? And so we were, we were talking a lot about that. And uh, so this leads me to ask, if the Queen wanted to depose the Prime Minister, could she? Would, would the, the, um, the army uh, in the United Kingdom uh, obey the Queen? Well, uh, on paper, she has those those rights. The reserve powers, of course, are there. Although uh, in the past century they've been used, the reserve powers have been used by vice regal figures, the governors general of Canada, Australia, and South Africa, but and the governor of uh, uh, Queensland, I think, uh, or New South Wales, Sir Philip Gabe, but never by the monarch. Uh, as to whether or not she could, uh, the, the very scenario you mentioned was looked at at a play that became a TV movie called King Charles III, in which uh, she dies, uh, the Prince of Wales becomes king. Now, in real life, he'll probably take the name George VII, because Charles III was the rightful name of the body Prince Charlie, and there are all sorts of connections to the first two Charleses that so they're saying that he'll probably not be Charles III. But if he is, is, it, anyway. is that the one with the clip where he walks into Parliament and dissolves Parliament? That's the one. <laughs> that was a great uh, scene. Every monarchist's dream. <laughs> but uh, you know, it'd be great to to have that happen. I I tell you, I was watching that. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, obviously, that would not fly with the oligarchy that rules the United Kingdom. 
Okay. Uh, and the likelihood is that she or he would be out of a job very quickly. Now, would the army live up to their oaths? I'd hope so. So the oath is to the queen and the king, yes. the monarch, yeah. Yes. And so, you know, I, I would hope, I mean, frankly, where where uh, had I written Charles III? I mean, in the end, his son betrays him, makes a deal around the uh, around his back with the prime minister, and he abdicates. I don't think now, it would. To me, I, I don't think it would go good for go well for the queen or king because now I'm reminded of what happened to Blessed Charles when you've got uh, what is it Horthy, and yeah. some of these other like they changed it up in their mind about. The oath, yeah. what they have, the oath to the king, and no, I have the oath to the people now, right? Well, this this is true of every Republican uh, politician in Britain, Canada, Australia, yeah. New Zealand. They all swear to bear true faith and allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen. Huh. But see, if you're a Republican and you swear that oath, you're a liar. Yeah. You're a perjurer. But see, they don't care because the political classes have very, let's say, flexible consciences anyway. It doesn't really matter. One thing you could be assured of is that if you had a Republic of England, because that's what you would have, Scotland would be out like that, a Republic of Canada, a Republic of Australia, a Republic of New Zealand, you could be assured that your political masters would keep their oaths to the country or the Constitution just as faithfully as they kept it to the Queen. Yes! And you'd be screwed over just as well or worse. Uh, I mean, if I had done Charles III, you know what? He would never have called Parliament back. <laughs> Bye-bye! <laughs> and the, and the uh, mobs of uh, morons in front of the palace? Oh, my dears. You really need to disperse, or there'll be no more welfare payments. No, I, I mean, that might be what Britain and the Commonwealth need. Whether they're going to get it is a whole other uh, kettle of wax. But uh, it, 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 if, 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 if the last year has shown us nothing, it's shown us that in addition to their lack of probity and honor, which we already knew about, even if we didn't like looking at it, the people that run us are so stupid and incompetent and petty, and yet they're totally in charge. They just run the show. This is the post-democratic age. And in truth, uh, you look at the reason I've had a lot of people say this to me, well, you know, monarchy doesn't look that bad now. Well, no. No, because the idea of having a person in charge who has some some concept of the way things work <laughs> and and a um, and a tradition to live up to, uh, as well as regardless of how well they they may they may fulfill it, the knowledge that they themselves are not responsible for their greatness, but that they owe it to someone else, to generations, to God not to themselves. Yeah, that looks a lot better. You bet. Um, it's certainly never perfect, but it sure as hell beats what we've seen. And it has worked for long periods of time in lots of places, uh, which our system has only been around for, depending on where you live, Two and a half centuries at the most, and in most places a lot less. Uh, you know, we're, we're celebrating the centennial of Republican government in Central Europe by showing how stupid it is. Whippy do, as uh, some people say. Anyway, um, All right. to answer the original question, no, I didn't see it. All right. Uh, question from Ander. Yeah. I, have a, I have a very good atheist friend who goes to daily mass. Hmm. It may sound strange, but he would like to believe, but doesn't. Do you have some advice about how I could help him? Well, sure, you could pray. 
uh, and you should become kind of a um, expert on miracles from the Shroud of Turin to the Eucharistic miracles and throw them at him. And lastly, you should point out to him that at the end of the day, faith is an act of the will. Um, why do you think um, an atheist would go to daily mass? Well, because against his uh, intellect, he's drawn by it. Obviously, he's someone with a, um, a great religious sense, and on some level, on a non-intellectual level, he's drawn to it, which is a blessing. I mean, drawn to what? You know, so, you know what I mean? Like he's if... drawn, drawn to God. But he has no faith. But well, he has no intellectual faith. But you see, we're not just creatures of intellect. We're very complex. I mean, it's the old thing, you know, you don't really believe that, do you? Well, sometimes we have better wills than we're... We let our intellect get in, our bad intellect get in the way of our good will. Wow. You should that, see the other way around. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> I, I'm I'm trying I was trying to parse that in my mind of examples of that, and it's almost always the other way. But wow, so this is an example of goodwill, bad intellect. I don't yeah. know if I've ever seen that in nature. <laughs> well, believe me, live long enough, and you'll see all kinds of things. Wow. Okay. But I, I would say yes. So you know. You've got to you've got to pray to God that your friend's goodwill overcomes his bad intellect, and you can even perhaps put it to him in those terms. The fact that he's drawn to it shows that on some level he knows it's true. Hmm. All right. Even if it's not intellectual knowledge. Right. A uh, question from Laura Lay. I'd like to ask about the effects of architecture style on people. For example, do you think or have you ever experienced that any kind of dissonance is created when the arch-traditional arm of the church, such as the SSPX, ICK, FSSP, uh, meets for Holy Mass in a modern-style building? I'm interested in how environment affects devotion, attitude, and behavior. What has your own experience been? Also, are these traditional organizations building their own churches, or just moving into existing buildings and making the best of things? Uh, both. Uh, the uh, There are times when they're stuck with whatever they can find, and you'll find when they do that, they're extremely ingenuous at adjusting them for uh, Catholic purposes. I uh, the, the, the most outstanding example I ever saw of this, believe it or not, was maybe 15 years ago, when the uh, Catholicus of Echmiadze in Armenia came to Los Angeles and there was no church of his own denomination big enough. So they gave him the cathedral. They rented him the cathedral uh, in downtown LA, which is a hideous monstrosity. But the Armenians were incredibly uh, ingenuous at fitting up, so it looked Catholic. I mean, well, Armenian, but you get what I mean. Um, it was an amazing liturgy, very beautiful. Uh, probably the first time a really Catholic uh, uh, liturgy had been offered at the, uh, I mean, in terms of style, had been offered at the altar there. But they are building their own, and uh, it's it's interesting that Cram and Ferguson which was traditionally one of the leading church architecture firms in the United States, going back into the uh, early 20th century, um, they pretty much got out of church architecture in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s for obvious reasons, and survived through doing all kinds of other uh, architecture work. <clears throat> but starting in the early 90s, they were initially hired for renovations of uh, heritage properties, that is to say, churches that the company had originally designed. And so the congregations that a given church would say, you know, they'd 
oh my gosh, Craven Ferguson is still here. Could you could you help us put you know refurbish the place, put it back to its original glory? Well, they started with that, but now they're building a lot of new churches, and a lot of these are Catholic. So, and they're you know in Gothic and various other styles, which they were always adept at. Now I mentioned this. Because it's very true that architecture does indeed have a huge effect on people and their worship and, and their style of living. You know, you'll be happier living in a beautiful place than an ugly one. You'll be happier worshiping in a space that's obviously intended for worship than one that isn't. That's kind of a no-brainer, but it seems to have eluded uh, the major uh, clerics and uh, civil planners of our uh, of our era. Uh you know, as far as type goes, you know, people often ask me, do you prefer Romanesque or Gothic or Baroque or Rococo or Neo-Gothic or whatever? I love them all. You know, the I love Art Deco, and I've seen Art Deco churches that are quite beautiful. Art Nouveau, Arts and Crafts. But with the Bauhaus, and so-called modern architecture, you, you have a break. And you have something that's ugly and lumpy and inhuman. Not unlike the ruling class that uh, has ordered it. This reminds me of, uh, it takes me really back to the early 90s. Um, to this epic day where I shook the hand of King Kigali... Uh, and that, but that was at Father Melito's. Yeah. And Father Melito's, I remember as a child thinking, this is so incredibly weird, because this is a church, but it's like in a building, and it's, uh, there, the, I just experienced this dissonance. This, it just yeah. feels uncomfortable. Like, this isn't right, you know. Um, but, yeah. I, I don't think that's so much the case anymore. Um, that was a, oh, well, that was a weird situation. It was I'll really say. when we were, we had a really everything was really underground. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. You know, that's for sure. Back when the Tridentine Mass was the uh, most evil thing you could do, um, and you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people in the church today who want to return to those glory days. Uh, the most recent thing at St. Peter's was very amusing. I, I didn't know about this. I was blissfully ignorant. Go ahead and tell everybody. Well, the latest uh, orders from on high at the Basilica of St. Peter's is several fold. It's not just anti Tridentine, although it is. The uh, Tridentine Mass can only be offered in a single chapel in the crypt at certain stated hours. Beyond that, it will no longer be the case that any priest can walk in, show his faculties, and get a side altar to offer a Mass at. No more Masses and side altars at St. Peter's. It has to be on the main altar and only at certain stated times of the day. Uh, is, isn't that because of COVID, though? Uh, it's, well... It's for the foreseeable future. It's from now on, they say. From now on. So this isn't yeah. just... I see. They didn't give a reason? Well, no, they don't have to. They don't need to give a reason. Of course, you don't need to give them any money either. You don't have to give a reason for that. My money will be present in memory and in hope. I, I, I'm not letting that go. I'm never letting that go. No, you shouldn't. That, for those who don't know, years ago when Cardinal Mahoney of blessed memory was gloriously reigning over the Archdiocese of L.A., his first letter on uh, the Blessed Sacrament declared that in the simple acts of breaking the bread and blessing the cup, Christ is present in memory and in hope. And my father's reaction was, oh, and that's how my money will be present in his collection plate. <laughs> Memory and hope. If you, you know, can, if a cardinal can say that, a cardinal can say anything. 
and he did. His was do. the mouth that never ended. Yeah. yeah. He was like McCarrick without the um, um, warmth. Yeah. <laughs> which I'm sure we're all very grateful. But, <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, again, the failure of the modern world is the failure of leadership. The failure of fatherhood, the failure of kingship, the failure of priesthood, the failure of masculinity. And things will improve because unless this is the end of the world, they always do. We've, History has had periods like this before. It's not a lot of fun to live through them, but what does Gandalf tell us? And I can say this as a mythopaic person. And Frodo says, oh, I wish this hadn't, hadn't happened in my time. And his, Gandalf's response was, so say you, so say I. <laughs> so say everyone who lives to see such times. <laughs> but you see, when it's not given to us to decide what time we'll be in. All that is given to us is what to do with the time we are given. You know, for me, I, I, I love living in this time. I think this is one of the most exciting times for anybody because the barriers to entry for media is completely broken down and that anybody can, can create an enterprise that any anybody anybody what you mean like we, we could just like start up a show anybody yes we could do that i mean like all right we, you're saying we could just like i mean get a couple of cameras sit in front of sit in front of them and like do a show that's literally what we did oh i knew that I just say we couldn't have done that ten years ago. Well, twenty years ago. What about when I was a kid, watching Bewitched? No. So basically, I was oppressed as a child. Yeah. I'm a victim. Yes. All right. It's good to know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you had it confirmed by official victimhood status. I was oppressed as a child because I was not allowed to have an internet podcast. You'll get your card in two to three weeks. <laughs> My victim card? Yeah. Void were prohibited. <laughs> All right. Not valid without a signature. <laughs> 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 very true <laughs> all right oh, all right this victim's moving on what's the next question all right a couple questions from diego okay since charles is one of the few frenchmen i am somewhat acquainted with does he know about the french acadians if so, can he relate their wild journey in the New World from Canada to Louisiana and beyond? And what on earth is a Cajun? I sure can. All right, please do so. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, basically, the Acadians were the French, primarily from Poitou and a uh, little from Brittany, that settled in the 1600s in what is now Nova Scotia. Uh, they called it l'Acadie, Acadia. Uh, unfortunately for them, in 1715, uh, because of the uh, outcome of the War of Spanish Succession, Nova Scotia was given to Britain. But they were allowed to stay uh, on the proviso that they would remain neutral in any future wars between France and Britain, which they did. Well... They continued to grow in numbers, you know, because they had children and stuff. It was an old French custom of the time. It was called marriage and family. Uh, and so they grew in numbers. But in 1755, another war was looming. Now, the governor of Nova Scotia at the time did not believe he could trust them. So he demanded that they take an oath of allegiance to the king of Britain that also included a renunciation of Catholic dogma. 
It wouldn't do it. What specifically? The Eucharist. Trust really? No church. Yeah. That was why Catholics couldn't hold office in those days, because they uh, had to... Uh, do, well, and also, of course, uh, uh, um, ending their, obedience, their allegiance to the Pope. So they wouldn't do it. And the, uh, the result was that they were expelled from where they lived around Grand Pre and basically dropped off in packages along the coast from Maine to Georgia. And some of them stayed where they were, but most of them ended up either going back to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the Gaspé, the Maritimes area of Canada, although not where they had been. So you'll find Acadian descendants all over the Maritimes, but very few in Grand Pre, which was resettled with Yankees from New England to replace them. And they stayed neutral during the, uh, the later revolution, and so were called the neutral Yankees. Anyway, uh, those who didn't go back gravitated toward Spanish Louisiana. And that first generation in Louisiana must have been hell on earth for them because the weather is so different from uh, the Nova Scotia. Nevertheless, they didn't stay in the city of New Orleans, but went out into the countryside, uh, south and west into the bayous and north and west into the prairies. And as a result, uh, oh, the, other, the other thing, the name that they got down there, one of the peculiarities of... Uh, the French spoken in Louisiana at the time was that they pronounced the D like a J. So the Creoles, as they were called, who greeted them, didn't refer to them as Acadien, but as Acajien. And that over time became Cajun. Uh, they settled in, uh, as I say, both in the bayous and the prairies. And although they're uh, related, I mean, you see the same families in both places, uh, the cultures are rather different because, of course, in the bayou, it's all about fishing and the water and alligators and so forth. And in the prairies, it's farming and, you know, that, that sort of thing. So to this day, prairie, uh, prairie Cajuns and bayou Cajuns are very different culturally, but they both speak French. They're both Catholic. And it's probably, with the possible exception of northern New Mexico, it's probably the most Catholic portion of the United States, culturally, politically, and in every other way. Oh, and I should mention, too, that one of the areas that the Acadians who went back to the Maritimes settled was the Madawaska Valley in the northwestern part of New Brunswick, northern part of Maine. And with American independence, that, of course, was divided. So the northernmost part of Maine is entirely French-speaking, Acadian. You know, it's an interesting thought process uh, regarding the oath against the Catholic faith uh, because I initially thought, how dare they, the audacity. And then you know, I thought they would never do that nowadays. But then I thought, they don't need to do that formally. No. You're just not... What was it, uh, Senator... Uh, what's her face? Not Weinstein, uh, but or Feinstein, but the other one. Boxer? Uh, yeah. Barbara Boxer. Uh, or her married name, Barbara Boxer Shorts. She uh, declared on the uh, in the House, of the, uh, on the floor of the Senate, that no, one, no Catholic who believes that his church teaches should ever be allowed to be a judge. You know, and that was, that was from the witch's mouth. I mean, she said what everyone felt. And how everyone behaves. Yeah. Yeah. The, only, the difference is that here it's a sort of soft discrimination. Yeah. In, in the sense that it's, it's, not, it's suppo not supposed to be for who we are, but for what we believe. Yeah. And of course, the problem with that is that if what you believe is different from what you are, you have no integrity. You should become something else. And that's true, whatever you are. I mean, if I were a Freemason and I came to believe that the Catholic Church was the only true church, 
there was only one way to worship the one true God. I have no business being a Freemason. Hmm. Because that's not what Freemasonry is about. It's about conduct over creed. It's about uh, not allowing religion to stand in the way of union with other men. Uh, you know, which you may like, you may not. If you do like it, then you should be a Freemason. If you don't like it, you shouldn't be. If you don't like the club, leave. Okay, uh, another question from Diego. Thinking about Charles and uh, Charles I and how he gave... Oh, thank you. Yeah. His... <laughs> thank you. I, I... Thinking about Charles, I wonder how he manages to, to continue every week without going crazy. <laughs> And how he gave his life for his people and country makes me believe that if he wasn't Catholic before his death, which might not be the case, I believe that he was a man of goodwill. That, that at the very least, I know, God is pleased with. But then, what about other monarchs of goodwill? Charles I of England lost his head for, among other things, not attacking the Catholic Church. Uh, Louis XVI of France lost his head for his people. Blessed... Uh, Carl of Austria lost his kingdom for wanting peace and leading a perfect Catholic life. Mary I of England had her progress thrown out the window, and Edward VIII was forced to abdicate for wanting peace in Europe and not wanting to be a figurehead. So, why is it that the more dedicated or devout people seem to get shafted more in history? It's because we live in a fallen world. It's because of the mystery of iniquity. I mean, you have to ask yourself, what would a decent ruler do with the likes of us? I, I don't know where to begin on that one. I don't know what would no. he do. <laughs> probably rip his hair out, probably be shafted the way they were. Oh, so I that's mean, what, what we would do with him. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, not that the orange man was the savior of the world, but if we ever got a leader of those caliber of that caliber today, well, he'd be savaged. And it would not be in his nature to have the people doing the savaging lined up, lined up against the wall and shot. You know, you, you, you didn't have problems with the media in the Soviet Union. You didn't have problems with them under Henry VIII. Because people like that say, oh, really? That's how you feel? <laughs> Bye. Boom. Oh, you're dead now. Still want to keep talking? But that is not the way that extremely decent people in power behave. And as a result, when they are opposed by people who are real scum, they, detain, they often lose. Not always, but a lot, lot of the time. A lot of the time. And when that happens, you have to suppose in a certain sense, which is that one hates to say it, they deserved it. Not, not the people who were killed, but their peoples. Um, I mean, a, uh, a friend of mine whose country will go nameless is nevertheless a monarchist and very fervent in his work to try to bring about a restoration. Whenever the heir to the throne does something that various people don't particularly like, they complain to him about it. His response is, so what are you doing? What are you doing to create the kind of kingdom a decent man would want to rule over? Or to be the kind of subject such a man would want to be king for? Yeah. This reminds me of a, a quote from A Man for All Seasons. I don't know if St. Thomas actually said this, but it's an epic quote. Uh, he says, If we lived in a state where virtue was profitable, common sense would make us saintly. But since we see that avarice, anger, pride, and stupidity commonly profit far beyond charity, modesty, justice, and thought, Perhaps we must stand fast a little, even at the risk of being heroes. 
But that's a terrible risk, ladies and gentlemen. So it's, it's, I also think of uh, Merle Vandenbroek's uh, saying back in 1920, the Germans ceased to have kings when the Germans ceased to be a kingly people. And I don't think that's just true of the Germans. You know, we, we, I, I, when we had the insurrection in Washington, you know, which still, still has all sorts of congressional people frightened. I was the irony of quote unquote revolutionaries surging into the rotunda under the watchful eye of the apotheosis of George Washington was not lost on me, nor was the respectful way they dealt with the, uh, the artwork and so forth in the Capitol. Hmm. Okay. Um, how powerful is the fact that, despite the vicious attacks the church has, is, and will go through, she still stands? Like as a tool for converting people along with the Eucharist, of course. I don't know. It just seems that after so many people attack her, she still cares for us. Seems to be, seems too good of a reason to pass up on the joys she brings, regardless of the challenges. Oh, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. I mean, you know, the church, uh, whatever, whatever you say about, uh, the clergy or the laity or anybody else, uh, the church is still, still our mother, uh, still spotless and still provides us the sacraments, uh, regardless of the unworthiness of her ministers or, or of her laity who received them, uh, God still allows himself to be brought down on the altar every day and given to saint and sinner alike. And he still absolves sinners in the confessional. To me, you know, I, I kind of jokingly po point that, um, you know, isn't it funny how the church is literally wrong on everything? Right, because that's how the modern world views the church. I mean, the church is basically yep. wrong on everything. But to me, that suggests an order in and of itself. I mean, that's not, you know, if the world is just pure chaos, you'd figure we, the church would get something right, a, a, a number of things right. But it no. seems, seems like we got everything wrong. And that it's, should it's, suggest an intelligent order against the church. Um, so I believe that's a proof in and of itself. Um, no, and, and of course, the very fact that the people who hate the church so much should produce the world we live in, that's a pretty powerful argument. You know, I, I always think of a cartoon my dad had in his office that had a bunch of lemmings running over a cliff. And there's one lemming standing aside, looking at them kind of quizzically, and the lemming closest to him in the mob shouts at him, antisocial? Yeah. <laughs> well, the church is like that. The church is, is saying constantly, don't run over the cliff. Don't do this. You're going to die. Shh. This isn't smart. Shh. You shouldn't do that. Shh. And every now and then someone says, shut up. You're trying to get in the way of my freedom. Shh. Okay. Uh, couple great questions from Joshua. I'm so excited for these questions. All right. Is universal suffrage a bad thing because it brings about mob rule, or is it bad because voting is always rigged and merely used as a smokescreen to legitimize the decisions of powerful elites without their having to take responsibility for those decisions? In other words, is voting more of a servant of the unbridled passions of the masses or a cunning tool for manipulation by the few? Are elections bad because they're real or are they bad because they're fake? I often hear both these reasons offered by critics of democracy, but they seem to be contradictory. Mm. Well, first, I think universal suffering is terrible. I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of local suffering. In fact, I'm not even in favor of individual suffering. Suffering. So universal... Oh. 
I knew that. I mean, like voting. Yeah. Sometimes it's not that different from suffering, like last presidential election. Anyway, well, to answer the question then in these radically reformed terms, uh, actually both are right. (laughs) I know that sounds contradictory, but the reason I say both are right is that the on the one hand, the elites use the passions and greed of the mob to lure them out to vote ignorantly, but to do so in terms of what the elite want. And they uh, basically they, they promise them the moon and the stars and they'll vote for them, and then they don't give it to them. The bait and switch. Uh, there are a lot of tactics like this. I mean, one of the most common in places like Ireland uh, over the divorce, for instance, back when Ireland was a lot more Catholic than she's become, you keep throwing referenda at your population until you get the right answer. On the same issue, you just keep throwing it at them. Eventually, you wear them down, you get the right answer, and then that's the sacred law of the land that can never be changed because it's the will of the people. Uh, voting in and of itself is, I think, should be definitely linked to what you're actually putting in to the system for two reasons. You have universal suffrage, just a mob vote. Well, what does that mean? It means that the vote of someone who's, you know, an illiterate streetwalker is the same as that, is worth the same as that of a, uh, a veteran turned uh, uh, scholar who not only has life experience, but actually knows something or two about how things really work. And yet, universal suffrage means they have the same voice. I don't think that's right. Not at all. I think I'm in favor of a qualified suffrage. Now, what do I mean by qualified suffrage? Well, firstly, if you're not able to read or write, you shouldn't be able to vote. Right off the bat. I think that you should be a taxpayer if you vote on something that's going to require the exp- the expenditure of taxes. Uh, particularly in our setup in California, uh, I think you, you really need to be a property owner if you're going to vote on uh, bond issues because that can, that's connected to the land tax. Now, that's why whenever I vote, uh, on such issues, even if I agree with what the bond's being issued for, I vote against it. Because you know what? I don't own a home. I have no property. I have no business raising, voting to raise taxes on other people's property when I'm not putting into it. If I were, if I did own a home, then I'd say, well, sure, then it's a question of whether or not I want a library. Am I willing to pay more to get a public library, say. And by the way, I would. If I were a homeowner, you bet I would vote for a library. Absolutely. But having said that then, I think A, no illiterates should be allowed to vote. B, uh, your ability to vote should be based upon what you contribute to the system. Um, okay, let me ask you a question I've been meaning to ask for a long time now. Uh, All right. You keep touting that we've entered in a post-democratic age, right? I do. You keep saying that. But my question is, why is that an important distinction? And let me, let me, uh, preface this with, um, you don't like democracy, and I, one I of the principles. I, I wouldn't say I don't like it. I would say I don't believe it exists. Okay, uh, you don't believe democracy exists, and you believe it's a smokescreen. Uh, uh, you, uh, it's a deception, uh, because every society has the rulers and the ruled, oh. and democracies pretend that the voters rule when really. Yeah. There's an oligarchy that's controlling things. Is that correct? Well, if I, yeah. Well, so, uh, given as, that, as in every culture that's ever lived. So given, the question is whether it's an oligarchy or an aristocracy. <laughs> okay. So given that 
modern democracy is what it is, um, why why are you saying that it's post democratic? I mean, because the oligarchy is still controlling. It's been as it's always been. No. Yeah. So it's why the new label? The new label because it's ta it's changed its tac its tactics and it's taken off the mask. There's no more pretense that elections mean anything. But the deception is still there, no? It is, but it's far less believable. I mean, you know, if you stop people now, before this past year, people would often say, well, I could, I've got the right to vote. I've got, I'm, I've got freedom. What the past year has demonstrated is, no, you don't. You can vote all you like and still do as you're told and like it. And it's in a way that's almost... You know, you have to wonder if God doesn't have a tremendous sense of humor in the sense that basic stuff we're not allowed to do. We're just not allowed. And we don't even dream of questioning it a lot of the time. I was amused by President Biden's declaration that if we're good, we may be allowed to gather in small groups on the 4th of July. <laughs> That was great. That was just great. If if we're good, so the, the, you would before this past year, they would never have framed anything that way. But as I've also said, when they had us put on our masks, they took off theirs. Okay, but our rulers and everything we have, everything we have. We have because they graciously allow us to have it. And if they wish, they can take it away, as they have done. But we as voters have given them the right to protect us. Yeah, okay. That's nice. They're using science to make the best they, decision possible. Yeah, I think they blinded us by with science. There's a song in there somewhere. <laughs> nice reference. Okay, I'll give you that one. Thank you. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's that's what they say. But again, uh, having lived through a couple of, of, uh, of uh, pandemics in the past, this level of, of utter control and unquestioning obedience we've never seen before. It's amazing. Even during the, uh, the great Spanish flu pandemic, you had certain restrictions. That, you know, they didn't last a year. That's a couple of months. And the flu went on because nothing was really all that effective against it. But the system hasn't changed. Haven't they They done things within the framework of the system? Well, yeah, it's much more controlling now. They're much more controlling. But, I mean, yeah. th that was... <sighs> they, they still govern with our consent, though. Do they? Do they indeed? Right. We'll see. We'll see if Governor Newsom gets recalled. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> his job, I think. <sighs> you know. Yes. Yes. The thing about Newsom is he could have been so. Con it's so easy to be controlling and manipulative if you're just have That's half stupid. a brain. Yeah, but he was stupid. So, he was a really stupid so guy. So I don't think that's proof that oh, we're not going to take it anymore. Like, <laughs> no, if he weren't so stupid, yeah, uh, it probably wouldn't have been. But he was very stupid. See that? But see, here's the perfect confluence. Their power has come to what so far as apogee, at the same time that their brain power has reached its stadium. <laughs> I mean, look at bloody Justine Trudeau. I can't help us all. <laughs> they have, the, they have the, the maximum amount of power over us and the minimum amount of brains. How did it's that a happen? Perfect storm. <laughs> well, there's some probably... sort of mathematical, like, social formula in there. It's like, well, okay, we've reached that level. <laughs> we're, we're at this point, yeah, where we're completely controlled by doddering idiots. Yeah.
it's 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 great. I I it might be as I say, God has a sense of humor and thought, well, okay, kids, you want to be run by scum, you get your you get what you want. Because don't forget, we're the same people who for fifty years in the United States, anyway, longer elsewhere, shorter elsewhere. Uh, we have tolerated the mass murder of millions of infants. So why should we be ruled by moronic scum? We're, you know, the hands are red. What's wrong with that? I mean, you didn't really think we were going to get away with it, did you? It doesn't work that way. There had to be a payback of some kind. And I suppose this is it. Okay, this ties nicely into our next question from Joshua. Final question of the epi- uh, of, for today. Uh, of the uh, final question of the epilogue. I like that. Uh, Saint Robert Bellarmine wrote that quote: "In a commonwealth, all men are born naturally free. Consequently, the people themselves immediately and directly hold the political power, so long as they have not transferred this power to some king or ruler." End quote. How is the modern concept of popular sovereignty different from the medieval understanding of popular sovereignty that Bellarmine and others wrote about? Is it merely that in the modern concept it is something perpetual, which in theory keeps the government in existence at every moment? Uh, for example, social contract theory, whereas in the medieval understanding, it's something that exists only at the inception of an entirely new government before the people consent to the particular system of governance. I'm having a hard time drawing clear distinctions. And also, how do you reconcile this with the notion that authority is hierarchical and flows downward from God? Well, firstly, you would need to read more Bellerman to know about the latter part, because he writes very extensively about monarchy and authority from God. So you don't want to you don't want to run away with only a single quote from Bellman. He wrote a lot more stuff than that. Secondly, um, the whole point of God is what the difference is. The medieval never saw anything separate from God. It, it, it the the people have no authority at all, save what they get as creations of God, as in soul creations of God. Uh, that's why hierarchy was part and parcel of everything they did. Um, the, the, as I say, if you take the, the, the little piece of Bellman you've got there, it sounds very much like social contract theory. But you've got to read a lot more Bellman and you'll see it in context. Can't take it out by itself that way. Um, the whole point of the social contract is that it's made by men among themselves without reference to God, without reference to the faith. And that right there is a world of difference. Um, see, the interesting thing is that for the medieval mind, the individual was not sovereign. He was the subject of God. He could not do or think or be whatever he wanted to be. Now, of course, we've reached the height of individual sovereignty and in that we can determine our own gender or in, invent new ones. Uh, we can yap about our truth, uh, my truth, as uh, Princess Megan would say. But at the same time, we're so completely controlled that we have to wear our masks and can't do anything we're not allowed to do by, by daddy or mommy. So, a world of difference. But read more Bellman. Especially, Tumblr House has... Uh, what do we have? We have a bunch of Bellman. Uh, I think uh, we have a bunch of books from Mediatrix Press that publishes Bellman on the Roman Pontiff, I believe. Yep. Um, let me see. Autobiography of St. Robert Bellarmine. Oh, Hell and Its Torments. Um, you actually read that. We have a, 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 a we have that on the Tumblr House channel. It's one of our oldest videos, actually, is Charles oh. reading St. Robert Bellarmine's Hell and Its Torments, which is actually a, a splash of cold water on your face, to be honest. 
Um, how really... old? How old? When did I do that? That was a couple days ago. <laughs> Just a moment ago. Uh, I believe you did that in the 90s. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, you know, I had transcribed that from uh, cassette tapes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you, what would happen if they got... They bought uh, the Roman Pontiff, and uh, which is where his, he really goes into monarchy and so forth. Uh, bought the Roman Pontiff and his autobiography. How much would that be? Actually, you, the Roman Pontiff itself on the Roman Pontiff is thirty-seven ninety-five. Wow! So that inherently is free shipping and handling. You get free shipping on that. Act now while supplies last. That's right. Um, Not an actor. Operator standing by. Batteries not included. <laughs> Void were prohibited. Sorry, no CODs. I'm just looking at um, I'm just looking at the description for this, and Father Ripperger gave a blurb for this, which is I've actually never even seen before for a book. And Father Ripperger says, Mr. Grant is able to retain the scholastic edge along with the accuracy of the translation while preserving a sense of the author's style. Because uh, obviously, um, I don't think anyone else has translated St. Robert Bellarmine. This is not a rep reprint. Uh, no. I think he actually translated this. He so. did. Ryan, Ryan Grant is a really, really good guy. Uh, well, that's the last question. There is, there is something we have to uh, mention. Yeah. About this upcoming week. Oh, it's... we're getting close to St. Joseph's Feast Day. I tell you what. We are, and we have something before that. It's not St. Patrick's Day, is it? No. Yes. Is it? Wow. Wednesday. This, this year has gone by so quickly already. How are we? I, I know. We'll be, it'll be Halloween before you know it. But... Uh, Wednesday is St. Patrick's Day, and that means you've got to get your Irish on, you know, break out that there canned beef that they don't eat in Ireland. They have bacon and cabbage, not canned beef and cabbage. They picked that up in America, you know, because they couldn't get Irish bacon. Just that streaky stuff you people have for breakfast. And yet, it's not just the Feast of St. Patrick. What else is it? The Feast of St. Joseph of Arimathea. Mm. The fellow who gave our Lord the Holy Sepulchre and who they say first arrived at Glastonbury and planted his staff on Wirial Hill and it bloomed forth and its descendants still bloom at Christmas and Easter and the Queen has sent a sprig of flowers from it every year and sometimes when you show us a Christmas message you'll see a vase with flowers. Those are from the Glastonbury Thorn. Not that I'm complaining, but, you know, this is, I think, the first year where we've gone through the calendar. And you, I don't remember you touting St. Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea uh, so much before. Well, now you know. He's one of my favorite saints, actually. I, wow, I didn't know that. You've never told yeah. us that. Well, now you know. See, stuff, hey, keep listening, you'll learn new stuff. But two days later comes St. Joseph's Day. Mm, there we go. La, 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 That's... St. Joseph's Table. Okay. What? What? That's fine. Uh, what, that... uh, what, what, what? Oh, now we don't like St. Joseph's Table. I always feel like you're mocking Italian culture. Yeah. Do you hear yourself? No respect. Do you hear yourself? Let me tell you something. My uncle Giovanni's turning over in his grave right now. And <laughs> oh, now you, that's that, right. now you can do this, this underhanded mocking, mocking of our beautiful my, I, and I rich learned culture. To respect, I learned to respect Italian culture from your uncle. <laughs> I was never given a choice, let me tell you. He said, none of that, none of that. You show respect or you know what, if you know what's good for you. And I knew it was good for me, so I showed respect. But no, it's it's. I love St. Joseph's Table. I really do. And if I were living in L.A. right now, and if our masters hadn't shut everything down, then 
I would go to the St. Joseph's Table at St. Peter's Italian Church on North Broadway, north of Chinatown. I really, uh, I really love that tradition. And it's funny, you know, in New Orleans, you have a lot of Irish, you have a lot of, uh, of Italians. So St. Patrick's Day and St. Joseph's Day kind of merge a bit. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, there are actually blacks in New Orleans who have St. Joseph's Tables. They got it from the Italians. I mean, it, it became so popular amongst Catholics of all kinds in New Orleans. Uh, it's originally a Sicilian custom. But the uh, where you are, of course, usually the Italian Catholic Federation would put one on at Holy Angels. Yeah. Have you ever thought of joining the ICF? You know, I actually got a scholarship in high school. A uh, small, very small scholarship from the ICF, and it's nice, but uh, I hate to be an ageist. It's all really, it's uh, senior citizens, you know. Like people complain, uh, uh, you know, like like young men complain, like you know, you know, Knights of Columbus are old, ICF's even older. So it's like, if I join, you know, when I, when I go into something, I go, I go whole hog you know what i mean like i really put myself into it you know and so it's like if i join the icf it's like i have to recruit i have to do all these things i have to get everybody else in, involved now who's showing disrespect for italian culture well also gotcha, there's I, one guy. also let me tell you you know what i was least impressed about the icf tell me the lack of italians Everyone there was there. No one there was Italian. Uh, what were they? Just white people, Irish people, you know, whitey. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> no, seriously, like there, there weren't that many Italians. And that was perhaps like the weirdest thing. I was like, I, I don't get it. Um, it just sort of like a, this generic social parish organization that has ice cream socials and spaghetti dinners well that sounds perfect are you easily also, bored you, by the elderly well you know let's talk about the icf like and its mission um i mean i like the knights as a vehicle you know to do things especially because i mean i we i haven't gotten to do this yet but i really want to increase um get adoration like an adoration group you know get spur that and spur those types of devotions uh does icf operate in that manner spiritually i suppose they can i mean it's it's very much a uh just a social club it's it's social but i mean they're they're very uh what's the word decentralized in the sense that in a lot of ways the local chapter can do whatever it likes so no reason you couldn't have a, an icf adoration hour that's interesting. For that matter, you could do it uh, in tandem with the Knights of Columbus. So, very decentralized. So you're saying that a person who is interested in doing good things could effectively capture a good chunk of the power in various local <sighs> chapters. Well, that's how your uncle did it. Hmm. This, I, have to, I have to investigate this and do some more research then. See course, if, you know what he, if, if he was still with us, you know what he would say about the current membership? What? Nice bunch of kids. <laughs> 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 well, uh, he was kind of up there. He was, he was, that's he true. Was, no, uh, yeah, he lived a good long life. He did, much to everyone's surprise. <laughs> yeah. Only the, you know why? Yeah, okay. You, you know why? Why? It's because he was quicker on the draw. <laughs> His speed never failed him. <sighs> All right. All right. So, moving quite along, we have these two days, you see, St. Patrick's and St. Joseph's coming up. And really, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a challenge in front of you. This is another one of the, our patented challenges. Yes, I think this would be a good thing, not a bad thing. 
as you know, we're all living under the COVID uh, trauma. Here's the challenge I place you. St. Patrick's Day and St. Joseph of Arimathea, of course, and St. Joseph's Day are days that need to be celebrated, honored, marked, observed. They really are the best way you possibly can. So here's the challenge. Let us know how you celebrated under COVID the most extraordinary way possible. I don't care if it, you know, you, you, you built a St. Joseph's table in your living room and invited all your friends or you, you sponsored some sort of weird movable feast with corned beef and cabbage for St. Patrick's Day and brought the Irish pipes or something, yeah, whatever. Whatever ad hoc, informal, put together way to mark adequately and properly these two great saints days you come up with, let us know. And what we judge to be the most extraordinary will be read next week. Patrons, send that in through the Patreon system. And uh, non-patrons, you can send it through uh, the Contact Us page on the Tumblr House website. That'll be interesting, I, Charles. I, I, yeah, I, I think I think it'll be very interesting. And, and honestly, folks, despite the fact that you heard this at the beginning of the COVID uh, crisis, incessantly to the point that you're going to get sick of it. Don't say In it. a real sense... What's that? Oh, okay. I thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to say we're all in this together. I was. We are all in oh. this together. But, uh, but by we, and here's where it makes uh, where it's very different. By we, I mean us. Our our happy family of uh, our our happy family of off the menu uh, uh, people. So we have we have gone through this year together. In, in this this insanity, you know, we've had some good laughs, we've had some good times, and please God, we'll continue to. So, even if you find yourself on both St. Joseph and St. Patrick's Day all alone in your room, do something. Even if it's just I don't know, watching St. Patrick's and St. Joseph's and St. Joseph of Arimathea documentaries. If that's all you can do, fine, you know, and having a, a, a glass of Jameson's. Whatever you can do. Uh, you know, did I tell you about how a friend of mine here celebrated New Year's Eve? Maybe. Tell, tell it again. Well, and this, this my friend Ralph uh, here in Vienna, he, he gets the, the uh, absolute prize for solo celebration of a, of a uh, holiday. I remember this one now. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it was great. He, uh, this was the first time, literally since he was six years old, he had been stuck celebrating New Year's Eve by himself, stuck in his apartment in Vienna. Now, it so happens that there is a show, a, a 13-minute long video called uh, Dinner for One, that in Central Europe, is it's English. It's an English comedy sketch. You can pull it up on YouTube. It's called Dinner for One. It's actually quite funny, but unknown in the English-speaking world completely until the advent of uh, uh, YouTube and video and all that, um, the Internet. But almost since its inception, it's become a regular uh, ceremony for people on New Year's Eve in Germany and Austria and Scandinavia and the Netherlands and so on, Czechia to watch this thing and it's a it's a story about this old, old 90 year old lady who's having her 90th birthday and her old friends are long dead so every year her butler sort of impersonates them and they have different courses the, the butler gets drunker and drunker he's got to drink the drinks of every one of the non-existent guests he gets drunker and drunker and drunker it's funny but they start out with, uh, gosh, what's the, uh, they start out, I think, with champagne and uh, some sort of entree. Then they have they have chicken and a white wine. I forget the exact dishes. They have fish, chicken, and then dessert, and they have accompanying wines. So my friend Ralph 
made himself each of the dishes paired with each of the wines for his New Year's Eve dinner. I mean, oh gosh, this is living the cliche. And of course, he took pictures and sent them out to all of us. That's funny. I thought you were going to tell this other, the other story about the Scottish guy who, uh, are Scottish or Irish, um, where he, when he gets drunk, so all right, I'm I'm done. Oh no, that yeah, Stephen Carney, yeah, no, well he a whole other story. Uh, when he gets, uh, it's quite true though. When he gets plastered, uh, he doesn't do anything. He just said, right, that's it, lads, I'm drunk, get out, and off he goes. <laughs> I can't get over that. That's so unusual. <laughs> no, I know. I know. He he just, I mean, he'll sit there drinking with everybody and everything's fine. And then suddenly, oh, that's it. Good night. And <laughs> at his bachelor party in Dublin, I, I was there with his other pals, you know, and I said, all right, guys, let's tell Stephen drug stories. Well, of course, there aren't any. There are not. So everybody kind of looks at each other. And he turned red as a beet. <laughs> and I said, you see, you're you laughing your sleeve at us because, you you know, there are no stories to tell about. Well, ha, ha, ha. Laughs on you now, pal. There's nothing to be said. You try to help your friends, you know. And I've been very blessed with a lot of them in different places. So, but I, I mentioned the story of Ralph, and for that matter, Steve, uh, a certain amount of solidarity. You know, as I get older, I really, more and more, I see the truth of that old phrase, union of prayer. So, gang, we really are all of this together in a certain sense. No, I'm not paying your bills. You're not paying mine. And most of us will never meet the rest of us. But we're still facing the same stuff. So from the bottom of my heart, I wish for each of you to have a very joyous and, and pleasurable St. Joseph's, St. Joseph's Day and St. Patrick's Day, St. Joseph of Arimathea's Day. And remember that the more you enjoy those days, the more you keep the candles lit against the dark. And then that, there's nothing better in this world. Hmm. So, do you, do you have a question for me? I think so. If it's Monday. Don't, don't, please, please. I, I do this without a doubt. Uh, it's off the menu. But what about the soul you save? You know what, boss? As your Uncle Giovanni might have said, in a similar circumstance, uh, might be your own. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, all. God bless. See you next week.